If you're able at this time, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? Our scripture passage today is Matthew 7, verses 13 through 29. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the, di- but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came And the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. At this point, I'll call up our lead pastor, Billy Glosson, and let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, it's so good to be in your house this morning, this day, Lord, Easter Sunday, when we celebrate all that you've done for us. So, Lord, I just pray that you would open our hearts to receive this word from Billy. I pray that you would be with him and give him boldness as he delivers what you've had him prepare this week. We just love you, and we thank you for this church family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated. Well, again, happy Easter, and let's do this. He is risen. Got to do it at least once right? Got to, got to. Hey, well, we're so grateful that you've joined us this morning. We're so grateful to be with you to celebrate. Um, If you weren't here last week and you would like to grab a copy of this, we have this for free out in the foyer as you walk out to your right. You'll see a box where you can drop those connect cards that you filled out. And also you can snag a copy of this. It's a great little resource called Is Easter Unbelievable? Fantastic book that walks through some of the doubts that naturally come up as we explore this day. Well, Our first Easter as a church was just a small group in my living room around a dinner table, and that was wonderful back in 2019 as we dreamed together and prayed about what God might do as we sought to plant a church. And the next Easter, I was preaching to a camera in my living room. It was 2020, and that was zero fun, right? So that happened. And now to be here with you, man, it's just so deeply encouraging. It is so encouraging to sing, to celebrate, and to see all that, has, that God has done in the life of our church. We are so deeply grateful to gather with you and to celebrate. And today, we're going to be finishing a sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is the longest recorded teaching we have from Jesus. It's from Matthew chapter 5 all the way to chapter 7. It's the longest stretch of words in the New Testament, right? If you have a red letter Bible, it's the most red letters you're going to see in one collected space. And today we see Jesus's deep and profound challenge that we would live an abundant life in him. Now, I want to preface our time together by saying the scene that we witness and that we remember on Easter, that there was an empty tomb, that Peter's heart raced within him as he had just denied him a few days before. And he goes in and sees the grave close. And just a few moments later, Jesus is among them. As they break bread, we realize that Jesus is alive. He is alive right now. 
He is alive. That alone is enough for us to say we should listen to the words of this man because no one else has gotten up out of the grave. Jesus' words are profound and his invitation is sure. Here's our big idea this morning, what I want us to focus on. It's simply this. Build your life on the rock of the risen lamb. Build your life on the rock of the risen lamb. Now, Jesus is going to present a choice this morning. And that's what Jesus does often. He gives choices. He often presents choices between one path and another. And he asks, will you follow the letter of the law or the spirit? Will you practice righteousness to be seen by men or to be seen by God? Will you serve God or will you serve money? He's been giving us choices all throughout the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus uses four images to describe two ways to live. Two ways. We start with the first set of pairs, two roads, two roads. Look at verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Life, friends, is a journey. And the reality is we're all headed somewhere. But the question is where, right? Where? And Jesus presents us with just two paths. That's it. Just two He says there's a broad road, an easy road with a wide gate that's bustling with people, but that road leads to ruin. And he says there's a narrow road with a small gate that's less traveled, but that road leads to life. Now, at first glance, the broad road, it might seem more appealing. I mean, it's broad, right? It's kind of like if you snuck through this aisle and there was a lot of us talking to each other. It's not easy to get through the narrow road, but it's easy to get through the broad road. It's open. It's airy. It's welcoming even. Anyone can go on this path. It's so spacious. It's so easy. But Jesus flips the notion on its head, showing us that it's being on the narrow way that leads to life. To be on the narrow way means being focused and intentional about our direction in life. A pilot will tell you that to stay on course requires constant adjustment and attention because veering even slightly off course can lead you miles and miles away from your intended target. And Jesus says to you, he says to me, pursue the narrow path, pursue it with purpose because it's within this narrow path that we find true freedom, true freedom. John 8, verse 31 and 32, Jesus says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Here's the whole point. The narrow way leads to abundant life. And you, friend, have a choice. Follow Jesus, pursue him, know him, walk according to his will and his ways, but know this, It's not an easy way. There's been a deceptive voice that's weaved in and out of the church for generations that says, if you follow Jesus, it's sunshine, rainbows, and kittens. And let me tell you, it's not. It's difficult, often lonely. One where you have to be intentional, right? One where the church is important because you need to find your people that can call you to stay on the straight and narrow way. Or we can drift carelessly onto the broad way. Many of us, we long for purpose. We long for direction. And it's easy to get pulled towards the broad road. The whole idea is that it is easy, incredibly easy, because it's the air we breathe. It's the flow of culture. I mean, the whole point of the broad road is that it doesn't impose boundaries on you. It doesn't care what you think. Personal views don't make any difference at all. Live however you want to live. Pursue whatever you want to pursue. Your career your children, your pleasures, whatever you want, the broad way pays no mind. The wide road, it offers this illusion of freedom, tearing down boundaries, allowing us to live as we please. But in reality, it leads to, Jesus says, destruction. Proverbs 16, verse 25. 
There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. While sticking to the narrow way, it might seem restrictive, right? It's actually the the blueprint for genuine freedom and real fulfillment. And Jesus says, make your choice. Because true freedom lies within the boundaries of truth, not beyond them. Walk the narrow road. So he starts with two roads. And next, we see he moves to two trees. Two trees, verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will, be, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. So how do you spot a true kingdom follower? Look at their life. Look at the fruit they're producing. See, it's not just about saying, I'm in. It's about asking, am I different because of it? Am I different because of it? If saying you believe, right? If saying I'm a Christian does not change how you live, that's like a tree that doesn't grow any fruit. Jesus says it's useless. That our life should be bursting with good fruit. Clear signs that God is doing something in us. Right, when we say fruit, we look over to Galatians and we see a whole list of things, right? Peace, joy, kindness, goodness, patience, gentleness, self-control. Do these things describe your life? There should be fruit that is being produced in you that makes people stop and think, man, there's something different about that person. There's something unique. There's something special here. But here's the deal. Some folks claim that they are all about Jesus, but their lives tell a completely different story. We're talking about arrogance that pushes people away. A faith that's all talk, but no action. Living a split life where your faith doesn't seem to touch your real world. Or a faith that's lazy. Or a faith that's just about following the rules. And then there are those who are obsessed with showing off their spiritual or doctrinal knowledge, but missing the point of actually knowing Jesus, of doing what God wants. It's a hard truth, but a lot of what gets called Christianity today might just wither away to nothing when it's put to the test. People watch how we live to see, is this Jesus thing for real? Does it make any difference in their life at all? And you know what? God watches too. And if our fruit is not legit, then we have to wonder about the roots. Have you ever found yourself asking, why do I keep doing this? Why do I keep stumbling into this? There was a Navy pilot who shared a story. He thought that the reason his lifestyle was so out of whack and it was so wild was because of all the peer pressure, right? Being in the military can be difficult and, and he had all these people. And so he transferred, he moved, switched scenes, get away from those friends. But what he found was it was a different place, but it was the same old story, the same bars, the same scenes, just new faces. And then it hit him one night. He did what he did because he liked it. Here's the thing, before someone really knows Jesus, right, truly knows him, walks with him, not just nodding along on Sundays, they have a busted want to, a broken want to. No interest in God, church feels like a chore, the Bible might as well be in code. Trying to force yourself to want the good and reject the bad is a no-go. But when your heart is made new, when you have truly encountered the risen Christ, It's like God hits the reset on your want to. What does that mean? It means he changes your desires. Temptation, it's still there. But now there's something more. You actually want to talk to God. You actually want to dive into his word. You actually want to hang out with people who get it. Church is not just another box box to tick. It's your family. It's where you belong because following following God becomes what you are about. So why do we do what we do? 
Why do we do what we do? It's simple. Our actions reflect who we are inside. Just like trees and their fruits. See, apple trees don't grow peaches. They don't. I mean, you could walk out there and try and hang apples on a peach tree, but that does not change its nature. Adding a few religious tasks doesn't make somebody a Christian any more than putting on a jersey makes me a football player, right? People look at me and go, no, right? Good luck. Friends, our lives, how we speak, how we act, how we love, that is the fruit that shows our true nature. It's like Jesus says, a good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. It's about what has changed inside, not just the things that we do on the outside. So two roads, two trees. Next, two claims. Verse 21, two claims. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Just like we only have two paths to walk, in the end, there are only two places that we can end up. And this bit ties right back to Jesus's heads up about false prophets, about our fruit. It all comes down to this. It's not just about saying you're in. It's about living like you actually mean it. Because claiming to follow Jesus without walking the walk, it's like a tree that never grows fruit. It doesn't add up. When we first moved here, we had some friends who moved into a home. And that first spring, we were blown away as we went in their backyard because they have wisteria. If you don't have wisteria, it is beautiful in the spring. It flowers and you see it and you're like, wow, that's incredible. Here's the problem. Wisteria is an invasive vine that takes over everything. Absolutely everything. I'll throw a picture up of it on the screen. That's wisteria. It's beautiful, right? Isn't that great? As it destroys your home, right? Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, said that we can deceive people by making all the right, all the right claims. Because like wisteria, if you see it from a distance, it looks like grape clusters. But when you get up close, you see that it's an invasive vine that needs to be pruned. The tragedy of tragedies is that Jesus tells us that there's going to be those who stand before him claiming to be Christians. Yeah, I went to church. I went to small group. I showed up. I put hashtag bless on my profile, right? I'm in. But they will hear I never knew you. Friend, you need to hear this. It does not matter what you do or what you say. What matters is who you know. Who you know. My question this morning for you is this. Do you know Jesus? Do you know him? John Piper wrote a book called God is the Gospel, and he asks a question at the beginning of it that haunts me. I think it will haunt you too. This is what he says. He says, the critical question for our generation and for every generation is this. If you could have heaven with no sickness and with all the friends you have ever had on earth and all the food you ever liked and all the leisure activities you ever enjoyed and all the natural beauties you ever saw, all the physical pleasures you ever tasted and no human conflict or any natural disasters, could you be satisfied with heaven if Christ were not there. This is my plea for you to understand. Jesus is the greatest joy and treasure. He is. More than wanting to frighten you, because I don't want that. I want to plead with you not to look at cheap trinkets and toys, but look at lasting treasure. You see, this world is filled with all kinds of new shinies to take our attention. It doesn't matter whether it's a you know, lifted up Jeep or a Tesla. It's all going to rot in the end. What truly lasts, what truly endures is Jesus. If you've ever walked with someone who knows him, you see this. There's this air about them, this character, this, this deep, settled peace. 
Because when we know Jesus, we don't just say, I need to live a moral life so that I can appease God, so then I can get back to my creature comforts. When we know Jesus, the whole of our life is aimed at knowing him and abiding in him. Because he is the true joy, the lasting treasure, the friend that never leaves. Finally, we come to our last set of two. And it's this, two builders, two builders. Matthew 7, verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came. And the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Jesus presents two builders, one wise, one foolish, two foundations, one rock, one sand. During the hot summer months, the sand around the Sea of Galilee was hard on the surface, But a wise builder knew that he needed to dig several feet below the surface to the bedrock in order to establish the foundation for their home. In today's world, right, full of acceptance for everything, a belief that all paths lead to God, Jesus' words cut through the noise with clarity and conviction. See, Jesus challenges, challenges this idea that sincerity in belief is all that matters, or that every spiritual path leads to the same destination. Instead, Jesus says, no, there's only two choices, two options for building our lives. One is on him and his teaching, which is solid as rock, and the other is any other belief system, which no matter how appealing it is, is unstable as sand doomed to collapse. And Jesus is urging us to consider not just whether we've made a commitment not just whether we've experienced change, but on what foundation are we building our lives? He's not saying Christianity is better just because of its religious rituals or because of its moral rules, which might not always measure up to others' beliefs. What Jesus is offering is not just a religion in the traditional sense, but a relationship, a relationship that is initiated by God towards us not ours towards him. Friends, that's the gospel news. Do you know that? If you look at every world religion, just take any of them, all of them almost sum up to the same thing. Live a good moral life and achieve either God's favor or a state of perfection and peace. Christianity flips it on its head and says, God pursued you who are evil, broken, full of doubt, envy, jealousy, rage, and says, I will love you and pursue you. That's the gospel news. It's a revelation of God's nature. It's a rescue mission for humanity. Claiming that Jesus is the ultimate answer isn't about putting Christianity on a pedestal. It's the understanding that God has revealed himself in Jesus. God became man so that we would know what he was like. And do you know what God is like? Gentle and lowly kind, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. God has revealed himself in Jesus to bring us back to him. The big question is, how do we respond to this? He is inviting us to know him. The world is full of talk about God. But what God desires and what will show the world the truth of the gospel is walking with Jesus and living according to his way. You see, when we live in the way of Jesus, when we live the kingdom way, it influences everything, our character, right? It impacts our actions. It defines our priorities. It guides our relationships. All of this to showcase a life that's lived in relationship with Jesus. This is the essence of the kingdom. The essence of the kingdom life is that Jesus says, come and follow me. So do we trust in the justice and love of a God who seeks out 
the lost? Are we building our lives on the rock? This means actively listening to Jesus and following his commands. Look, guys, it's easy to fool people. You can fool me very easily. It's easy to fool the pastor. It's easy to fool our friends. It's even easy to fool ourselves. All we have to do is learn the vocabulary, adapt some cultural conventions, and then we're good. But Jesus does not want any of us to fall to such delusions. It's apparent when he concludes the Sermon on the Mount, he's instilling some healthy fear into our lives. Here is my question. Do you know him? Do you know Jesus? When I think about knowing Jesus, I think of a hymn, Abide With Me. You may not know this song, but it's one that I deeply love. It was written by a man named Henry F. Light. It was written many, many years ago. He wrote it one evening when he was broken because he had just preached his last sermon at a church that he dearly loved. He had been diagnosed with a fatal illness and it was already seizing him and his doctor advised him to retreat to sunny Europe, sunny Southern Europe, and he was preparing to sail. And the last Sunday before leaving, although he had absolutely no strength to stand and preach, He forced himself and he preached to his people and he wept and they wept. And that evening, by the light of the evening sun, he was broken because he loved these people. He loved this place. He didn't want to spend his last days away from them. And he wrote these words. I'll put it on the screen. Abide with me. Fast falls the eventide. The darkness deepens. Lord, With me abide when other helpers fail and comforts flee. Help of the helpless. Oh, abide with me. I grew up in the church. Remember in high school, like feeling convicted because I didn't really want to. Again, I had that busted want to. I thought it's just, I've got to be good enough. I've got to try hard enough. And really, we all feel that way, whether you're in the church or not. Cultural has its own rules and narrative that we have to abide by and do. It wasn't until I understood and knew who Jesus was and have walked with him through unspeakable pain and sorrow, who stared at positive pregnancy tests with my wife and rejoiced as we told friends to sit in a hospital room hearing about how much blood she lost. I've sat with friends who've experienced unspeakable atrocities. I've had moments where I've asked why. And in those moments, I don't need a positive solution, a warm, fuzzy Instagram post. I don't need to try harder or do more. I need the help of the helper of the helpless. I need the risen lamb who knows me and walks with me. I need the one who the psalmist said that I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. Why? Because he is with me. He's not a concept. He's not some moral compass of a way we should live. He's a person that you can know truly, deeply, intimately, more profoundly and real. Do you know what Jesus has done to pursue you? The eternal God that existed, who speaks cosmos into being, decides, I will step down and become a man. That alone should shatter our brains. That God would choose to come and put on flesh and walk among us. That the God who hung the stars in the sky would be laid into a trough and poked and be uncomfortable in the hay. Jesus walks on this earth and he sees those who claim to know him, his chosen people, make a mockery and a sham of who he is. And he's patient. He's kind. He sees people who are deeply broken, prostitutes, people who take other people's money, who are evil and wicked in heart. And he loves them, tax collectors, lepers, 
those who would make people unclean just by their presence, he reaches out and he touches them. And then he dies. A gruesome death. A humiliating death. Because of our rebellion. Because when we stand before a holy God, all of our sin, all of those thoughts that we would never say out loud to someone else are laid out bare and we can't stand in his presence. But Jesus says, I come to make way through the curtain that will be torn, which is my flesh. No longer are we separated from God, put behind a barrier, but Jesus says, I will pave the way with my blood. And now, friends, we celebrate because he did not stay in the tomb. He got up, breath breathed into his lungs. My favorite scene, we have a book that we gave away to the kids. I'm literally going to write the illustrator because I need it. I want to put it on my wall. There's a picture in it of Peter hugging Jesus on the beach. It's, my fa- it's in John 21. If, you, if you've not read it, it's a great thing to read today. Jesus shows up on the shore and makes breakfast because breakfast is the best meal. And he, he's there and Peter, who has all this humil- humiliation and shame, who doesn't feel good enough, who feels unsure of himself, sees Jesus. And you know what Jesus does? He restores him. And he hugs him. He says, feed my sheep. Jesus died and rose to conquer the grave and to lead you to abundant life. I have so deeply enjoyed the book of Pilgrim's Progress. It's this allegorical story of Christian, right? Traveling from the city of destruction to the celestial city. It's a rich metaphor for the kingdom life. I'll put this first picture up on the screen for you. This is kind of who we see at the beginning of the book. You see Christian with this big burden on his back. And he's trying to flee from the city of destruction. He, he's reading this book that's telling him about this celestial city and this great king, and he wants to know him. And so Christian goes on through the narrow gate on the narrow way and faces a myriad of trials, right? Temptations and challenges. He goes through the slog of despond, the hill of difficulty. He encounters characters like evangelist, hopeful, and even the giant despair. And he's carrying a heavy burden on his back. And then this is the next picture we see. And I want to read an excerpt while this picture stays up there. This is from A Pilgrim's Progress, a more modernized version. It says this, Now in my dream I saw Christian on a highway that was fenced on both sides by a wall named Salvation. He started running up the way but quickly found it was difficult due to the burden that was still on his back. And as he ran to the top of what seemed like a small hill, he saw a cross and below it a tomb. And just as he approached the cross, his burden fell off his back and tumbled down the hill until it rolled into the opening of the tomb and was never seen again. Sensing an enormous relief from his burden, Christian became so excited that he cried out in joy, Jesus has given me rest by means of his sorrow and life by means of his death. He stood there for quite a while, weeping as tears streamed down his cheeks. He was in awe of what had just happened to think that just the sight of this cross could remove his burden and give him peace. And suddenly, three shining angels appeared to him. And one of them said, peace be with you. Your sins are forgiven. A second angel stripped him of the old rags that he was wearing and dressed him in new clothes. And the third angel placed a mark on his forehead and gave him a scroll with a seal on it. And the angel then instructed Christian to look at it for comfort as he ran on the highway and then to, to deliver it at the gate of the celestial city. And after this, the angels left him. And Christian could barely contain his joy. And catch this. He began leaping while passionately singing. I've traveled so far with my burden of sin. But no one could ease the grief I was in until I came here. What a place this is. Is this where I will start being blessed? Is this where the burden fell off my back? Is this where the cords that bound to me broke? Bless the cross. Bless the empty tomb. Blessed rather be the man 
who was there put to shame for me. Four questions for you today. First, how does the hope of the resurrection influence my daily living? Do I live as if Jesus is truly risen and active in my life? Second, have I consciously chosen the narrow path that Jesus talks about? Understanding the challenges and the eternal rewards it offers. Third, what does walking with Jesus and living according to his way look like in my daily life? How does it shape my character, priorities, and relationships? And fourth, how am I responding in, how am I responding to Jesus' invitation to build my life on him? Am I hesitating or fully committing to his way? We'll put all four up on the screen for you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so deeply and profoundly grateful for who you are. God, that you would love us, pursue us, that you would speak life over us. We who were once dead in our sins are made alive in Christ because Christ has conquered Satan, sin, and death. Hallelujah, Lord, the tomb is empty and our hearts can be made new and our greatest treasure is you, Lord. It's you. God, I pray this morning for those who are on the narrow road, but it is difficult, it is lonely, it is hard. Lord, I pray that you would deeply comfort and encourage their heart this morning to know that you are with them in the darkest moments your presence is there, leading, guiding. God, I pray for those in this room who maybe claim to know you, but realize, Lord, that truly it's a claim. And it's no more than that. God, I pray this morning that they would put off all of the pressure, the worries of well, what, what will people think? Who cares what people will think? Would we care what you think, Lord? I pray, God, that you would regenerate hearts right now. God, that you would stir and call. God, those who are far from you, who maybe wandered in because they were invited on this day, Lord, I pray that you would awaken their heart. That you would draw them to you and would you help them see, Lord, it's not about this feel bad, try hard, do better. It's come and see. Thank you, Jesus that you love us and that you pursue us. We pray all of this in Christ Jesus' name, amen.